Thanks for joining us. I'm Nancy Furness, and this is We've Got Issues. We are filming on site at the Coquitlam City Centre Library, and we'd like to thank the library for um, allowing us this space to carry out the interviews. I'd also like to acknowledge that our interviews are taking place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded lands of Coquitlam First Nation. So we thank the Coquitlam people who continue to live on these lands and to care for the lands and the waters and all that lies above and below. Joining us today is Maureen Curran, who is the BC Green candidate running for MLA of New Westminster Coquitlam. So thanks so much for joining us today, Maureen. Thank you very much for having me here. It's really nice to be back in this end of Coquitlam. I lived here once upon a time and it still feels a bit like home. That's awesome. Can you tell us a little bit more about your background and maybe also why you have decided to run for the BC Greens? For sure. Um, I'm a teacher here in Coquitlam, have been for 26 years. I've been teaching both at Terry Fox Secondary and now at Centennial Secondary. I'm also a mom um, and a scientist, that's my background. Uh, I live in New Westminster, have raised my boys there, so I'm very connected to both communities. Um, I would uh, say that my intention was never to get into politics directly, that was not my thing, but I do always believe in standing up and uh, First of all, standing up for rights, for the people who are not um, able to speak for themselves, for being able to get in and represent my community and do my bit to help out. I've you know, coached Little League, and when I showed up at my kids' school the first time uh, in New Westminster and they needed someone on pack because there was almost no one there to help out, I put my hand up, pulled in some friends, made things happen. That just who I always have been, right? My mom raised me to be someone who helps out in the community. And over the last few years in particular, it's become obvious that the NDP pretty much lost the plot. Um, I was once upon a time a supporter of their work, but we can see they've been flip-flopping more and more. They've been straying from their values of helping out community and getting caught up. And the, the biggest one for me is the fact that they're giving billions of our tax dollars to fossil fuel industry, the same industries and global corporations that are making record profits. Meanwhile, we know that we need that money for housing, we need it for education, we need it for health care. Our communities are struggling and we don't have the money to invest in them because it's being spent on, well, making rich CEOs even richer and I'm not okay with that. Um, I really do think that we can take a new direction, and when I see Sonia Firstenau, she is a leader that I can trust, she's got integrity, she sticks to her values and actually wants to represent her constituents. That's something I can get behind. Well, thank you for that. Um, I think I appreciate the fact that you, like Sonia, uh, didn't get into politics for politics sake, that you have come with a background and a lot of experience behind you that led you to getting into this um, field. So one of the things that you mentioned is you're a scientist. So I'm just going to jump right in there and ask you, what do you think is BC's biggest environmental issue right now? And what would you like to see done about it? Well, um, I have stood on the front lines with land defenders because I feel like so many communities are being hit with um, the kinds of changes that, again, like I said, are benefiting big global corporations and not benefiting local communities. Um, and there is a huge future out there. BC for a long time has a history of being a resource-based um, economy. And yet, modern times have shown that that's not really necessarily the truth anymore. It's less than 4% of our economy. Um, and it's getting, a, unfortunately, an unfair amount of of attention and realistically I work with kids I have kids I want us to plan long term I want us to have a future that includes everybody and that doesn't look for short-term gains mm. that have long-term horrific consequences and losses so what we need to do is look around the world and realize that globally 10 percent of the globe's um, recent economic growth has been in clean energy and we're not 
on that curve. We're letting it get ahead of us and jump way past um, while we get left behind. It's like we're still investing in carts and buggies in 1920, just about when uh, the, the cars are going to take off and, and take over. Well, that was then. Modern times have moved on. We need to move with it. We've got all these young people with incredible skills. We could put them to work in those industries and have long-term jobs that are healthier, that are safer, and that help us grow a really uh, vibrant green economy that benefits everybody, not just always pitting one industry against another. There are win-win solutions out there. It doesn't have to be economy or the environment. Right. It can be both. And that's where I think BC is really missing the mark. Um, locally, that looks more like helping us build buildings that are going to, again, meet modern standards, be really more efficient, mm -hmm. be easier for us to take care of, be healthier for everybody. And in the long run, we've actually shown that the technology is there. It doesn't have to cost more. Transportation is the same thing. Are we going to keep going down the route of pretending that we can crush more cars into the road? Mm -hmm. or are we going to build multiple modalities so that people have the options of doing transit or um, doing, uh, taking their scooter and e-bike and all those options. So there's so many places that we can do better. Right, and we'll talk about some of those in a little bit more detail in a, a couple of minutes here. Um, so that's sort of a British Columbia, or probably a Canada-wide <laughs> environmental issue. For your own riding of New Westminster, Coquitlam, mm -hmm. what do you see as the biggest um, environmental challenge there? We are a really dense neighborhood, mm -hmm. um, and we have been really trying hard to meet all those housing targets that the BC NDP mm -hmm. have been throwing at us. So we have huge towers going up, and again, a lot of congestion. So I do think that the transport is a massive issue, and maintaining uh, the green spaces that we do have, and even trying to grow them a bit, because mm -hmm. we know how much mental health and everything is affected by our ability to get outside, especially for kids. And I think you've got an interesting, because you've got some of Coquitlam and New Westminster yeah. in your riding, so you're dealing with two municipal level governments um, mm -hmm. and talking, just like you were talking about green space and trees, and there's going to be different approaches and different challenges. So I appreciate that you're, you're aware of that at this point and, and that you do support green spaces because we know they're so important for us. Um, I guess the next thing is there's so much we have to cover and there's so many issues, but mental health and drug crisis. The, we, we're mm -hmm. looking at all these intersecting crises. Uh, BC Conservatives have long supported, or as long as they've existed, they've supported involuntary treatment. BC NDP is now saying that they do as well in the case of severe drug addiction, mental health, and brain damage um, instances. And they are implementing these, or planning on implementing these it, um, in uh, sort of, I don't know, correctional institutions. Do you think that that is the answer, or is there more that we need to do to resolve this issue, or these issues, I should say? Well, thank you for this question, because this is one that I hear a lot. Um, just the concern in general over the, the increasing crises, both in housing um, and in mental health and addictions. It is a very complex issue. There is no silver bullet. Yes. And pretending that uh, a simple thing like, let's just throw them all into some kind of safe enclosure and pretend that that's good for them or for our communities is wrong. Absolutely, there are some individuals who need to be protected, mostly for their own safety, and I'm not saying that it will never be a part of the solution, but it is a small part. And there are much under the Mental Health Act, we do have that ability. Exactly, right? we already do, yeah. and we are all already. We have a record number of people that are um, pretty much incarcerated for their own safety. Um, going down that route should be an absolute last option. Mm -hmm. We haven't gone even close to providing the services in between. There are hundreds of people on waiting lists to get into voluntary treatment, and we don't have the beds for them. We're allowing the, it to be entirely done by the private sector, which you know is not accessible to all. There needs to be more public investment and in making sure those mental health supports are there early and have all different levels are fully integrated. One of them being that we need them in schools, so we catch kids early who are struggling, and they don't end up 
growing because like mental health, like everything else, early intervention is a huge, huge indicator of whether or not that person is going to be treated successfully. Right. Plus, when you get long term, we need housing because a huge number of people are struggling and end up in those things because they are unhoused and they end up in unsafe environments which result in brain trauma and those mm -hmm. other things. We could have cut that off by providing the housing for them. And a number of other stages, like after treatment, releasing people back into a community that supports them. If they're just dumped back on the street, where are they going to end right. up again? How easy is it for them to fall back into bad habits because they don't have the supports to help them make better choices? Um, there's a lot of layers there, but in the long run, it costs us less to help people as well as just being the right thing to do. Yes, no, I, I appreciate that sort of fulsome response there because I think it isn't an easy issue and we could probably talk about it a lot more. Exactly. <laughs> um, and hopefully we will, right? I think it's something that has kind of flown under the radar for far, far too long. And now we're seeing the consequences, of course. Um, so we had talked a little bit about the path forward for a sustainable economy for mm -hmm. British Columbia. And I think the BC Conservatives are touting British Columbia as a resource superpower, and you were talking already about how we have been you know, so resource-based and the need to move away. Did you want to say anything more about that? Where do we need to move to? Absolutely. Yeah, I think you know, going back to 1970 just isn't going to happen. We're living in a new economy in a new t part of the world. Um, Freud Rusted's lost, uh, you know, been stuck in a time warp there because uh, over the last 20 years, we've seen the forestry industry continue to drop. It's right. lost more than half the people that used to work in it, um, and its share of our um, tax revenue has dropped under $2 billion, whereas tourism is now more than $2 billion. Right. So if you look at uh, continuing to damage our environment, which is one of the big things that draws in people from all over the world to see beautiful BC, uh, if we're cutting down those trees, destroying the old growth, ruining the biodiversity, that's wrecking our tourism industry. We need to plan a sustainable forestry that allows for mills mm -hmm. to be not being closed. We need to actually have local development of those products. That's how we're going to keep all those communities alive. We're talking about some secondary manufacturing here Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and rewarding and making it a requirement that they have that our forestry has that kind of long-term planning and that mm. isn't just about you know turning forests into tree farms that have no biodiversity and that are more prone to fires which then impact our health impact our tourism and destroy other people's jobs we need to plan win-win situations where we're looking at integrating these things so we can keep our forestry going but also you know keep growing our tourism industry and all the other things that depend on a healthy environment so you're sort of highlighting some of the interconnectedness here and you're saying if i hear you correctly that there is room for a forest industry in bc as long as it's done sustainably but that we also have to look at the bigger picture including ecotourism and things like that as well and a healthy environment of course absolutely they are all connected um we we simply cannot have you know even healthy farms when, I, when we're dealing with things like, I know that there were, um, with all the droughts, uh, with climate change, mm -hmm. the impact from that, any industry that's using water, like the fracking industry, um, right. is pulling a lot of that away, then has impacts on other industries. So why are we doing all these short-term mm -hmm. you know, uh, economic benefit, but ignoring the long-term economic consequences for all the other community and um, resources that should be sustainable, like farming and like exactly. well, that are so important to us. <laughs> exactly. Um, I want to talk a little bit about transportation. Mm -hmm. um, we see that there is increasing traffic in our urban areas. Is there something that can be done there? What is your plan to maybe offer different transportation options? Or do we need different op transportation options? Oh, absolutely we do. And um, honestly, for where I teach, um, so there are a lot of kids in my classes that are coming from Asia and they say it's ridiculous. Where they grew up, yeah, everyone has nice cars, but they use them on weekends. Nobody uses oh, them really? for a commuting day to day okay. um, because you can get everywhere so much more efficiently by train and by transit. 
if we built smart, we would have be able to get people around in comfort for much less money mm -hmm. with better health outcomes, better cleaner air, all those sorts of things um, are benefits by having multiple modalities. Yes, the car has a place. It's not like we're trying to, you know, not let people drive. We just want to make sure that it's people are using a car when it's actually the best option and not because they have no other option. So expanding our tra transit uh, will just help goods flow more easily, help people who do need to use their car, right. make sure that they don't get snarled in traffic all the time. And I think really encouraging communities to be you know, more local, because that also promotes local businesses. Mm -hmm. If people are able to get out and around comfortably, they're more likely to walk down the street or take their e-bike or scooter and you know, support a local business and then be able to be back home really quickly and pick up their kids from school that way. All those sorts of things are going to make our streets a lot safer. And I think getting out and about myself, I would like to ride my bike a lot. I find it makes me happier too. I think you hit on a whole bunch of points there. Um, I, you know, I, I hope that some of these can go forward because it does make for a much more livable and, and pleasant community to be in when you're not choked out by the cars and, and it's more walkable. Um, can we go back to you mentioning that you're an educator? Yes. You've been a teacher for quite some time in the area. Mm -hmm. What would you like to see with respect to our educational system? What changes would you like to see in order to make sure that students are fully supported, like right from maybe kindergarten or even preschool, right through to um, graduation? What do we need to do? So yeah, this is a big issue for me, mostly because I lived through it. I watched our system get dismantled under Christy Clark, and John Rusthead was part of that. And I hear from what he's saying, that's where they want to head back again. And it was horrifying. Um, my own son is autistic. He did not get the supports he needed because they were, they were yanked. Um, and my other son, who you know would be is quite a strong student, his classes were still impacted as well. And I see this a lot. Some of my colleagues are leaving because they're so stressed out and burned so out. Are you talking about um, having um, kids with maybe higher needs in the same exactly. class without the adequate without seat the support? support? So we have a word to say that um, inclusion without the supports is basically abandonment, and that's what's happened. We have a lot of kids that are being put into classes and they mm -hmm. should be there, they belong there, but they do need extra support. Mm -hmm. And yet my good friends who work in learning services are struggling every day to make the decision about limited EAs, who gets one, who doesn't. Oh, well, sad. And that's really and hard. Yeah. So we have so many kids that aren't meeting their potential because they're not right. getting the support they need. We know our classes are too crowded. We know that they're, the kids need mental health support. So these are all things the Green Party has promised to actually reintroduce school psychologists and mental health supports for kids, EAs and learning support teachers actually being guaranteed so that we don't have an IEP that never gets met. And I honestly think that's going to do a lot for the teacher shortage mm -hmm. because of the biggest reason Stress. a lot of teachers leave is simply knowing that they can't meet their students' yeah. needs is too stressful. Well, and you've brought it up a couple of times, so I hear that it's important, is having that early intervention in schools, mm -hmm. identifying um, challenges that could quite likely be um, dealt with and, and leading to a more a happier, more productive life later on. So exactly. you're intercepting a lot of issues early on. So kudos for that. Uh, now, we've got a lot to cover, so I want to go back to your environmentalism. Mm -hmm. You have a background in environmental activism. Um, we have seen a number of cases where activists have been criminalized. So we have the land defenders, the Wet'suwet'en, you know, they had the um, pipeline running across their land without their consent. We've seen Ferry Creek and the blockade folks um, being criminalized. And I'm just curious how you, as a Green Party MLA, would ensure that the democratic rights of protesters, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, are protected. There's a lot to cover in that one, but I'm <laughs> going to start with this. I was actually appalled recently to find out Canada has its very first prisoner of conscience. Yes. One of the first things I ever got involved in with activism as a kid was writing letters for Amnesty International. Yes. And we have a local indigenous land defender who was thrown in jail yes. simply for protecting his own lands. He's been identified as a prisoner of conscience. We should be appalled and embarrassed. And this has to stop because no indigenous person should ever be jailed 
for simply wanting to protect the land. That is their right. That is their role. We acknowledge it in UNDRIP. And UNDRIP. We've exactly. We've adopted UNDRIP. Yes. Um, and so many other uh, places. So that, that absolutely. The other thing is I think it's a huge hypocrisy. As a teacher, we spend all our time teaching about the amazing work of the Viola Desmonds of the world mm -hmm. and the Rosa Parks mm -hmm. and how awesome they were for standing up for what they believed. And yet, when people actually try and do that now, in a peaceful way, in a thoughtful way, they are getting uh, jailed and, and they're getting assault teams, SWAT teams, incredibly expensive, taxpayer-funded police sent after them with dogs and rifles pointed at elderly, yes. <laughs> elderly people who are, and, and women and children. This is not the Canada that I believe in, and it's, I just have to say, BC can do better, and I think our tax money needs to go to things that actually support and help communities, rather than uh, shuts down a community when it's just standing up for its own health and safety in the face of basically invasion by these global multinational corporations. Mm -hmm. So you, that's bringing up bigger issues again, showing how all these interconnections are, are taking place there. Um, you know, as a new MLA, um, and in a party that won't likely have a majority government, if you get to Victoria, how will you make all these thoughts and ideas, and how will you make your input and your voice heard? That is a great one, because it's true. The Green Party has very low chance of being the actual government in power. But we have a long history of working really well across party lines, of collaborating, and being able to hold the ones that are in power to account. And that is something that I'm really excited by. Um, personally, I know that the other reason I joined the Green Party is I'm allowed to vote as my constituents and my conscience dictates. So no whipped votes. I am not a whipped vote. I don't have a party uh, bureaucrat behind the scenes who right. wasn't even elected making the decisions about how I vote and how I represent my constituents. So you will be representing your constituents and not simply towing the party line. That's right. I can listen and I can actually act on what they tell me. Mm -hmm. I think that that's something that we all want to see more. I have one last question. Um, the current political landscape has changed um, recently in BC. We've seen the BC United Party mm -hmm. um, disappear from this campaign, and now we have basically the Greens, NDP, and BC Conservatives. Do you see this as um, uh, reducing it to basically a two-party um, race, or do you see opportunities here? 100% opportunities, honestly, because I mean, the, the, the folding and the, the shenanigans of, of, of trying to merge parties entirely for political points shows that they're more interested in their own goals mm -hmm. than in meeting the needs of BC citizens. Um, they're not interested in democracy, they just win at all costs. That is not uh, something that I think most people support. I think we do want to go back to the situation where people are represented honestly by their MLA. And I think with the number of independents running who have a choice, the number of strong green candidates we have out there, I think there's going to be some surprises, and I think it's pretty exciting. I think we have a chance to really turn BC around. I think you're right. It's an exciting election, and we will find out on October 19th Thank you. what's going to happen. So I'd like to thank you so much, Maureen, for coming in and speaking with us this afternoon. Mm -hmm. I feel like I've learned a lot. It's been actually really fun. I have to say, as someone who's not a politician and I'm not used to this interview, you made it really friendly and fun, so thanks. Oh, well, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Um, this is We've Got Issues. I'm Nancy Furness, and we've just been speaking with Maureen Curran, who is the Green Party MLA candidate for New Westminster Coquitlam. Thank you.